we grew up together in the uh, Jane Finch community. And so I feel like I, I have, uh, I've already had a, a front row seat to uh, some of the parts in the book. And it's been a pleasant read uh, thus far. I'll admit I haven't completed it yet, uh, but uh, uh, I, I know a lot because I've been part of it. Um, so I'll just, I'll just jump into an introduction uh, about Steve. Um, uh, Steve was appointed uh, uh, to council on October 2nd, 2017, after the passing of Councillor Tom Egan. The town held an open and competitive appointment process, and Steve was chosen as a successful candidate. Following Steve's appointment, um, Shelburne Mayor Ken Bennington was quoted as saying, he just seemed to be the most prepared, the most confident, and had some great ideas for inclusion in our new diverse community. He was just a step above the rest. And um, I, 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 I'm not surprised by this quote at all, because that's the Steve that I know. That's the Steve that I've witnessed, the Steve that I've seen growing up and uh, uh, had the influence on my life, on myself. We, uh, we grew up together, went to school together, uh, went to law school together, um, lived together when we went to law school together and, uh, and um, you know, played sports together, have been competitive together for many, uh, many years. And, uh, and, and that influences what's rubbed off on me also. So I consider myself already a beneficiary of uh, Driven to Succeed because my friendship with Steve has led me to where I am uh, in life today. Um, with that, um, I'll continue with the introduction. Uh, Steve Anderson is also a lawyer, a practicing lawyer with the Toronto Transit Commission. Uh, he's had over 13 years of uh, experience. Um, he's also He's he's currently elected, been now an elected deputy mayor for the town of Shelburne, uh, and was sworn in on a, on December twelfth, two thousand and eighteen, uh, and um, that's it for uh, the introductions. I will move on to uh, uh, questions that I'm going to jump into with Steve, and we're going to uh, pick his brain and have a discussion about. Uh, his book. And the first question that I have that I'll start with is, uh, Steve, what was the motivation for Driven to Succeed? I'd like to hear in your words, what motivated you to, to write this book? Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Ian. I know I can always count on you and pumping up the tires. So <laughs> I certainly appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate, obviously, DCCBA, uh, Alethea, your team. Uh, I see uh, many of some of the people here on the screen. I see Curtis. Uh, thanks for, for, for joining, as always, my brother. Um, listen, man, the, the, the reason behind the book was simply, um, first and foremost, it was for myself, to be quite honest with you. I think when you're writing an autobiography, you're not necessarily thinking from the jump that this is for the world and I'm going to transform the world. Uh, it's such a personal, personal experience. Um, because as, as I've said to folks, um, it forces you to examine your life all over again. Uh, oftentimes, we've buried a lot of our past, the good and the bad, because we're constantly focusing on what's in front of us and what is maybe 10 steps ahead of us. And we seldom reflect on our past and our journey um, as it was. And so this experience allowed me to do that for myself and certainly for my family. Of course, the second element of it was to be able to inspire individuals who may be doubting themselves, um, who may be questioning whether success is possible for them because of the circumstances they face. And I, and I tell people that you don't necessarily have to grow up in Jane Finch to understand challenges and obstacles. You could be in Rosedale, you could be in any affluent community. We all face challenges and adversity, but as I say to particularly our young people, it is how we respond to our challenges and our adversity that determines our future and our legacy. So this book is about pointing those things out in a very authentic way so that it would resonate with the reader and give them hope and inspiration that if Steve could do it despite these challenges, then I should be able to accomplish the very same things for myself. And so that is the driving force behind um, the writing of the book. 
Okay, thanks for that response. And uh, let me just put it out there to everyone that we encourage questions through the chat. So please um, submit your questions through the chat. I will continue with a few uh, more questions that I have. And so the next question I'm gonna jump right into is Steve, in, uh, in chapter, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, in chapter three, you entitled it, show me your company and I will tell you who you are. What role did your friends play or your company play in your life? And, um, and, and what role did you play in theirs? Mm, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> well, I mean, Ian, you spoke about sort of the, uh, the competitive nature you and I had growing up, uh, both living in Jan and Finch. Um, and Ian is an example of making the right decision when it comes to selecting your friends. And as he indicated during the intro, he talked about us being friends for almost or over 35 years. And so when you're making the right decision, this is what it looks like in real time. Um, uh, I, I say in the chapter that we spend a lot of time focusing on choosing the right spouse. And I see Julianne and Andrew James, when you talk about choosing right spouses, um, choosing where to live, the right job, et cetera. Um, but we seldom put the emphasis that I believe is required on our young people in choosing your company and your right friends, because oftentimes they are the ones that you're spending the most time with. And if they're influencing you in a positive way, as I say in the chapter, Ian, that you, you could see yourself uh, reaching new heights that you yourself have not imagined. Uh, I also talk about in the book of me at a point in time where I chose the wrong company and the trouble that I, and the path that I found myself down where it almost derailed um, my future ambitions. And so it's really just to highlight for those who may be in a similar situation, who may need to let go of a uh, current uh, set of friends that they may have that may not be leading them in the right direction and to let them know of the significance and the importance. This is what happens when you're doing things in real time, but the significance of making the right decision. So when you ask the question, Ian, I, I think about you. I think about who Ian is a practicing lawyer himself that grew up in the Jane Finch community. I think about Maurice, who's mentioned in the book, who is a doctor with the armed forces. I think about my friend Andrew, who is a, a motivational speaker, TEDx speaker, and many others. As I talk about in the book, these gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, had what I refer to as a successful mindset, even though themselves were not successful. You know, when I met these gentlemen, they were still living in the Jane and Finch community. It's not like they were parachuted in from some other community and now were come giving me advice. They were living in the same building in the same community that I was living. But the difference is that they started with successful mindset that success was possible. And that influenced me to be like, you know what? These guys are talking in this way and they believe it with, and they say it with such conviction that it is a reality despite the circumstances that we all found ourselves in. And so I say to people that you could find yourself in difficult situations. It doesn't mean that you have to stay in difficult situations. And that occurs first and foremost with your mindset and changing your mindset. Okay, thank you for that response, Steve. I'm gonna keep going uh, through uh, the chapters, uh, moving on to chapter number four, learning to be a leader. And it's only that you read more than chapter four. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you haven't, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I have. <laughs> All right. That's good. Um, you you talked about your uh, your MVP moments. And I remember that MVP moment because I was there. <laughs> I played on the same right. team with you and, and, and I voted for you. <laughs> Tell us about that MVP moment and what lessons you learned from that. Hmm. Yeah. I had a feeling that uh, Lethe has something to do with that uh, question. Um, th that chapter is entitled, I think, uh, learning to become a leader or lessons of leadership. Um, and, um, I talk about how, when I was around you guys, you know, you guys had me feeling like I was a leader, um, when I was at CW Jeffries in Jane and Finch. And, uh, but I had a narrow definition of what leadership was all about. M my definition at leadership at that time was if I'm successful, then I am a leader to be emulated by others. And so I took that approach, even in the sport of basketball, as you know, Ian, we played on the same team and I, I did well. I became one of the leaders on the team, scoring a lot of baskets, leading the team in scoring. And I thought that, you know what, I, I had made it. And 
when it came to the end of the season, it was time to hand out the MVP award. Uh, as many of you know, there's always that big assembly. All grades are assembled. The place is jam-packed. So just go down that memory lane with me, folks. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, hey, we didn't get as far in the season that we should have, but I know this award is mine. Like, this is a lot. And of course, you have to have a ride or die guy that tells you for sure, yes, Steve, you got it. And that was Ian, right? Steve, you have this. So I attend the assembly and I'm sitting close to the stage. The coach is on the stage wrapping up the season. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, just get to it, man. And so he goes, and now I'm going to announce the MVP award. And I start getting out of my chair thinking like, okay, it's time for me to make my way down. I already rehearsed in my mind what I was going to say. I knew where the trophy was going to be back at Eddie Stone, where I was going to place it in my room. And then as I'm walking to the stage, all I hear is, and the MVP goes to Freddie Carew. I'm thinking like, this is a joke, right? Like, my name is Steve. It's not Freddie. Um, but clearly the message was, it's not what you do for yourself. It's what you do for others. And so, yes, it's important to strive and achieve your goals. There's nothing wrong with accomplishing that. Uh, but a true leader goes beyond hoarding uh, power or influence for themselves True leadership is about empowering others. And the reason why Freddie was chosen, and I came to understand that later on, I didn't want to accept it at the time, but I came to learn that under, un, to understand that later on, that what Freddie did, he, he didn't lead the team in scoring, but the team felt that he spent the time and invested the time to make sure that they were a better version of themselves. And that's true leadership. And so th yet, yes, it was an embarrassing moment, but it was a moment that was needed because it really shoved, shaped my, my thought process moving forward as to what true leadership looks like. And so even in the position that I'm in right now, a leadership position, it's about, again, empowering others and allowing others to believe that this platform is also possible for them and being able to encourage them, inspire them, and provide them with the tools so that they too could be successful. Thanks for that response, Steve. I I, as I said, I voted for you at the, during that MVP vote, and uh, <laughs> I think I think you'd win that 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 award today. You know I what? Think, I, I you know I, I want to see that paper that you wrote my name on because now I'm having some concerns. No, no, I, I did. I voted. For you. <laughs> I, I I voted for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the next question, um, Chapter Five: Crash Course on Adulthood and Family Responsibilities. What was it like leaving your mom? leaving home and going off to the University of Windsor, if you could just speak to that experience, going off to university, uh, just to share with us your, your insights from chapter number five. Well, I mean, the first feeling was, now I'm the big soups on campus, right? Like, I, I'm, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm the man, right? I'm independent. Um, I'm away from home. I'm away from the Jane Finch community. I'm in Windsor. I have my own place. Uh, and I'm thinking like, I have arrived. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I'm the man. And within a few weeks, I found out that I wasn't anything close to the man. Like I was calling home, uh, asking my mom, how do I cook the rice? Uh, is it okay to put colored and white clothes together when I'm doing my laundry? Like these are the things, you know, that I was calling home on a consistent basis. So as I talk about growing into adulthood, I was learning the ropes of what it meant to be an adult. I didn't have the cushion of being at home where, as you know, Ian, when mom is there and she's taking care of everything, she's cooking, the laundry is there, the house is clean. And you may, if, if you're lucky um, or maybe unlucky, have a minor role to play in the house. Uh, you're not paying any of the bills. You're not responsible for a budget. You're just eating, sleeping, and you're leaving the house and you're coming back in. Well, when you're living on your own, you quickly realize that it's a lot more to it than just doing that. And so I had to grow into that. Um, the one thing I, I, that really did help me along the way was the fact that we played basketball and sports. And I say to parents, it's important to at least av uh, avail your children if they're interested in sports, because it's more than just slapping a puck into a net or dunking a basketball. It teaches you life skills, how to work with other people, to be disciplined, understand your role, work within a team environment, uh, et cetera. And I think that helped me in the transition when I went to university. And then as you know, um, as I was finally starting to figure myself out, uh, then children came along the way and it was now uh, being responsible, not only for myself, but being responsible for others. Okay. 
I've I've got one of those folks in my house that eat, sleep, and uh, basically just uh, <laughs> who doesn't? Off of me. Yeah, it's a sixteen-year-old, but uh, and I, I'm sure he will go through that experience when it's time to kick him out to university. Next question: What life lessons did you learn from your ebony and ivory experience? When I first moved to uh, university. I wasn't one of these fortunate students that had a, had an apartment by myself. And so when I got there, I was sharing a dorm room with uh, with somebody else. But when I when I got there, my roommate wasn't there. And so it was later on that evening, the door opened. And who did I see? It was this um, uh, short Caucasian gentleman named Jamie Shea. I'll never forget him. He was studying to become a police officer. And so he and I became that ebony and ivory. We became best of friends. Uh, we had something in common, which was the law. But I say in the book that his presence wasn't a shock to my system. You know, sometimes you hear people say when they move to certain communities or they go to certain places, they travel to certain places. Oh, man, it was such a culture shock. Uh, it, it wasn't a shock for me because growing up in the Jane Finch community, as you know, Ian, it's very multicultural. Um, we had friends from across the world uh, that we grew up with. So me hanging with somebody from Thailand or from um, uh, anywhere else in the world was not foreign to me. So when he came in, I mean, certainly he came in to open arms and we embraced each other, learned from each other. Uh, and I think that's very important. Uh, you know, it, it was an early lifehood lesson that I grew up with in Jane and Finch that applies to today when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And we talk about the importance of that. And that's important when you grow up with people, you have an understanding of other people and their different cultures, et cetera, et cetera. And it allows you to break down barriers, I believe, and really champion not only for yourself, but for other people as well. So that was basically, I think, the Ebony and Ivory experience that you're referring to. I see, Alicia, you have a hand? Or is that a... Yes, I do have a hand, but I also want to acknowledge a few people that have just um, joined us. Councilor Lisa Post from Orangeville is um, on with us, and we have some amazing community leaders, Dr. Cooper from Shelburne Optometry, of course, um, and Josh, who, who is here with us again. Andrew is just joining us, Jennifer Brown, uh, Julianne and Andrew James, thank you for joining us, and of course, Curtis and Kareen and Shayla. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, I would like to ask my question now, and it's going back to high school and that moment that essentially changed your life. And I think you touched on it briefly in the book where you had a teacher that had that significant impact on you. Can you just expand on that moment and, and elaborate a little bit more on the role that teachers play in you know, shaping young minds? Mm, yeah, shout out to all the good educators uh, that uh, play a role, especially in the kinds of communities that um, we're referring to, Jane and Finch being included. Um, uh, whether it's Jane and Finch or some other part of the world that is you know, written off, marginalized, um, you know, the, 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 you know, for those who read the Bible, you know, the question is, you know, what good can come from Nazareth? Uh, and so the question certainly was, what good could come from Jane and Finch or fill in the blanks to any other area that you may be familiar with around the world. Uh, and so growing up with, um, the negative stereotypes, uh, the perceptions, the biases, uh, the negative media attention. If you're not careful and you're not focused enough and don't have the strong enough mental fortitude and the people around you, you could start to believe the hype as they would say, right? You start to internalize that, you know what, maybe they're right and success is not for me. And it was in this grade 11 course that I took, it was a law course. And prior to that, I was all over the map. I wanted to be an actor, shout out to, uh, Andrew James. I wanted to be an actor, a real estate agent, bus driver. I was all over the place as to what I thought I could be, uh, despite the environment that I was in. And it was this grade 11 law teacher that said to me uh, at one day after class, uh, Steve, you know, I've been watching you for a while. And let this be a message to those who are on that how we conduct ourselves, how we portray ourselves is very important because we never know who is watching us. We never know who is taking notes and observing our conduct. And either we give something to the world where they appreciate or we don't. Uh, either we give something that people respect or they don't. And so she said to me, I've been watching you over the last two months, how the way you've been conducting yourself in the class, absorbing the material. And she said to me, Steve, 
you know, I think one day you would be a really good lawyer. And from there, the light bulb was on. And I laughed when she said it because I thought she was joking because um, as a racialized person, especially as tall as I was back then, um, sometimes, unfortunately, you're pigeonholed, right? Some people believe and would say to you, oh, man, Steve, you're really tall. You'd be an excellent basketball player. Maybe you should go to the NBA or whatever the case may be. And not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but it seemed that that was the ceiling um, for a lot of people when they saw me. And so to have an educator look beyond sports, to have an educator look beyond the circumstances of being in this kind of community and what was possible and her herself not buying into the stereotypes and then saying to me, Steve, I think if you stay focused, you'd become a good lawyer was enough to change my trajectory. And from there on, I knew that this is what I wanted to be. And uh, ultimately I became that. And so, so a salute to her, a salute to other, the educators and those who play a positive role in people's lives and making a difference. Okay. And thank you for that uh, response, Steve. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, um, I, actually, I do see a, a hand up, um, I believe, uh, Curtis Vermont. Uh, yes, thank you, Ian. And uh, it's great to be here. So, Steve, I, I had a question for you based on um, um, one part in particular I remember reading, and it's kind of popping up to me now based on the trajectory of the conversation now. Um, did you, did you find it important to highlight the United Nations gang and, and effectively your United Nations perspective, especially in today when we do see a lot of polarization and um, even in particularly in the Black community where many people are turning inward? Um, did you find that really important and maybe a, a form of activism even in mentioning it? Yeah, you know, um... People see a finished product uh, or they see who a person is today and may not necessarily understand where that comes from. And so uh, a lot of people who may research me or know what I'm about, um, I'm big on diversity and inclusion. You know, one of the, the, the tags I had during my campaign was Shelburne Stronger Together, right? And so where does that come from? It didn't just come out of nowhere. It wasn't something I just woke up one day and said, you know what, I think this is gonna get me elected, right? Uh, it was an experience uh, that I had growing up and understanding the importance of diversity and inclusion, understanding the importance of different perspectives. You know, so when I talk about my friend uh, Tian that lived to me on one side at Eddie Stone and my friend Surjan that lived and at one day I'm eating South Asian food and the next day I'm eating, uh, you know, European food and they're eating Jamaican food and just that and there was no barrier, there's no walls. And here we are enjoying each other, enjoying each other's cultures uh, and learning from each other. And so that's where it started. And so we were all enriched by that experience. And so when we turn inwards, we lose that experience and we lose that perspective and we lose that learning opportunity and we lose that care and regard for each other when we turn inwards. And so when, what we see happening in society is that turning of, uh, of inwards. I'm only looking out for me, people who look like me and to hell with everybody else. And we see what kind of society we have as a result of that. And so I was very intentional, Curtis, and I thank you for asking the question. I was very intentional in putting it there to allow people to know that this is where it started and the significance and the importance of that early childhood experience and, uh, and how that culminated to the person that I am right now and the belief system that I have uh, today as well. Thanks for that response, Steve. I'm just going to follow up next with a, a faith-based question because I, you know, we we grew up in the church together. That's uh, where we, I believe, we first met before um, before I think it was grade ten when we uh, we were in high school together. But we first met in church, and so I do want to ask you about your faith and how that played into who you are today, your your drive to succeed today. Etc. 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 Please just speak on. Speak on. Mm, mm. Well, you know what? I, I'm going to spare anybody uh, with a sermon, um, but I think it's <laughs> it's a it's a it's interesting interesting question 
uh, and the timing of your question, because I just got off a platform and I see uh, Bella Carter here, and she wrote a book about her Muslim faith and the importance of sharing that with the world, again, breaking down barriers, breaking down issues, and how her faith has played such a significant role in who she is. And I think uh, whatever your belief system is, um, it's important, I believe, to have a source of strength. And for other people, it may be something else. Um, but certainly for me, as you know, Ian, and maybe for others who are uh, tuned in, um, faith had a lot to do with it. And, and I was, you know, when I did an event at the Orangeville Library recently, and I made it a point to say to people before I left that I don't want anybody to leave here to and, and, and believe for a second that Steve was able to overcome all these obstacles that are mentioned in the book. And it was only done because Steve pulled up his socks, rolled up his sleeves, and just, you know, um, you know, put in the work. It, was that a part of it? Absolutely. You know, uh, faith without works is dead, they say, right? And so, but along the way, there was no question, you know, uh, I had that church family, Ian, as you know, always praying for me every step of the way. I had my mother always praying for me, uh, praying for our family every time we stepped out the door to make sure that we were going out safely and coming back safely. These things played a major role in, in my life. And so just like anything else, you know, I was saying to somebody earlier that when you have something, and this is not to Bible thump anybody, but, the, you know, what I say to people is if you had something that benefited you and you knew would benefit your family and the people who are around you, would you not want to share that with them so that they could benefit as well? Right. And so I, I share it only in that way is this has really helped me. And, and I want to be able to share it with others and say that this could be a blessing for you if you're open to that opportunity and to allow it to be a blessing for you. And so for me, yes, absolutely. Uh, faith has been um, a strong component and remains a strong component because those are the same lessons that I pass on uh, to my children as well. Okay. Can I steal the spotlight and ask um, another follow-up question? Faith-based again. Um, you touched on it in the book in two different sections where I can draw some parallels. So one, when you landed your internship at TTC and then the full-time opportunity. And then I think a second point later, to, later on in the book where um, I believe you were accepted into a different university than you had originally intended. Um, for law school. So can you just touch on uh, those two components again and expand on what it means, you know, around what is meant to be yours, will be yours and having that faith, um, despite what may originally be perceived as an obstacle or a challenge, right? But I'll let you finish mm. the rest and, and share. Mm. Mm. Uh, I think for anybody that's listening, and especially when I speak to um, young people, uh, we live in a world where everything is instant um, on social media. Um, and we expect things to happen for us today, if not latest tomorrow. Uh, and if they don't, then we're considered a, a failure. Um, and we need to have patience and we need to have faith that when we put in the work, the results will come. And I say, stay in your lane. Don't worry about how fast the cars are going in the left lane or the lane adjacent to you. Stay focused on the lane that you're traveling because you're on your way to your destination some may get there quicker to their destinations before you, but just focus on your lane and eventually you'll get there. Um, when I had to take a year off from, when I got into law school in the States, I didn't get into law school in Canada. And I got into law school in the States. And uh, after my first year in Detroit, I had to take a year off and work in a collections agency. And here I am back in Toronto, calling students on their defaulted student loans. Imagine that, right? Like I'm a student just a semester ago, and now I'm working at a collection agency at Shepherd and Leslie, calling students on their defaulted student loans. And I remember thinking to myself as I was doing this, I knew I was saving money to go back to Detroit the following year, but I'm thinking to myself like, man, and, 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 and this hopefully will resonate with the younger people that are on this or anybody, but I'm thinking to myself like, all these people who started school with me are now ahead of me. Right. They're now, you know, they're, they're in their second year, maybe going to their third year. And here I'm stuck in one gear back in Toronto working in a collection agency. And let me just fast forward the story. Eventually, I get back into Detroit. I transfer and join Ian, as Ian knows, we were in Ottawa and I graduate from the University of Ottawa. And eventually, when I graduate Ottawa, I 
uh, get a job at the TTC. When I started at the TTC as a student, an articling student, you have to work for 12 months back then before you get called to the bar and then eventually you become a lawyer. And so when I started the job, they said to me, Steve, the chances of you getting hired back after your 12 months is next to zero because we've never hired a student back in numerous years prior to you. So I'm listening, I'm working for the TTC. I used to take the Jane bus to Jane station to go to church with my mom Saturday mornings. I'm just happy to be here and get the experience. And I'll, I'll figure it out after that. So I said, okay, cool. And I put my nose down. The guy who interviewed me for the position that I got uh, for the 12 month uh, contract, at the near the end of my contract, he takes a job somewhere else. Now the position becomes open. They interview me along with other student, uh, other uh, candidates who were more seasoned than me, 10 years of experience. This guy was 20 years of legal experience. And I'm now interviewing with people who have similar experience. I interview, they offer me the job. And getting back to staying in your lane, being patient, put in the work, keep your nose down. And when you get to your destination, you will get there at the time that you ought to get there and not a moment sooner and not a moment later. I get the job. When I got there, if I had gotten to that job a year earlier, I wouldn't be working at, this, at the TTC right now. For 18 years, going on 18 years, I've been working at the TTC. If I'd gotten there a year earlier. So all the disappointments and the setbacks in me working in a collection agency was just preparing this opening that I eventually walked into by God's grace. And so that's another example in how it worked in my life. And so I say to people, don't worry about what's happening around you and how quickly things are happening around you. Just stay focused on what you have to do and you will get what you need to get. Thank you for that. I see that we have a question in the chat or Sheila oh. can ask the question directly if she likes. I mean, we haven't had much time to talk since uh, you launched your book. In fact, there's been a lot of fanfare, lots of people surrounding you and if it wasn't the pandemic, they'd be knocking on your doors, I know. Um, it, but, you know, picture after picture with people holding your books. So it's just been a lot of stuff happening. But before it got to this point where people, you know, started buying your books, started knowing about it and, you know, all this excitement, it, it, it took you a long time to write it, you know, putting your thoughts together. And did you discover, like, something that you didn't expect about yourself while you're writing it? You know, mm. I mean, you know, you're going to write about driven to succeed about your life, Jane and Finch. And then, you know, the you know, it's and it's incredible, like being the first black lawyer at the TTC and deputy mayor. Yes, there's that story. But what about what you went through? What surprised you the most when you wrote it? Mm. And uh, I think I would recognize this question too, being an author, you know, I'm sure you sometimes have those aha moments going, <gasps> you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think the first thing, um, Bella, was that we can't bury things and assume that they're going to stay buried. Eventually, they were percolate back to the surface. There were very there were things that were unresolved. You know, I talked about the separation of my parents and stuff that I thought I had um, neatly tucked away. And, you know, would have no impact on me. And I realized that many years later, going back and revisiting that, that the impact was still there. And so one lesson is, if you have unresolved issues, resolve them. Um, trying to tuck them away is not going to help you in the long term. Eventually, they'll come back and you'll have to face them. So that's number one. Number two is when I was writing this, I felt pretty confident in what I had accomplished and putting the story out there to a degree, um, you know, um, but what surprised me was even with that confidence initially, then I became insecure. And in the sense that, and this may surprise people, but I'm just giving you the real uh, straight goods uh, for those who may be thinking about going down this journey and the ups and downs and the roller coaster ride. Um, I started to think as I got near the end, man, like, what am I doing? There, was all, there, were, there were questions that would creep into my head or thoughts rather, you know, what are you doing? Why are you writing this? Who's gonna care? Uh, you know, it's not like you're Barack Obama. And so who's going to want to buy it and read it? I'm not Margaret Atwood. And so are people going to pick it apart for this and that? And I almost talked myself out of doing it because of these voices that kept creeping into my head. And these are the things that sometimes discourage us 
from achieving our full and maximum uh, potential. And they often say that, you know, uh, greatness is seldom achieved in our comfort zones, right? And if we don't get out of our comfort zones and overcome our fears, um, um, then we're not able to be a blessing to ourselves and, and much less our community. So uh, it surprised me of how insecure I thought uh, or I was at the time. I started thinking, are people going to like this? I hope people like it. Um, I hope somebody takes something away from even if it's just one person. Um, and then I prayed about it and said, you know, at the end of the day, I'm putting it out there. And if uh, somebody uh, takes something positive out of it, then, then great. And now it's turned into obviously what you've seen. And it's just been a great blessing. So uh, yeah, those are some of the things that I learned about myself um, and that um, sometimes we see people and we think, oh, they have everything. Uh, they seem very confident and mature and they're well-spoken and they seem to have everything. Um, and that may be true on the outside, but there's still insecurities and doubts and you still have to beat back the, the voices of criticism, self-criticism and doubt and fear to continue to be great. Uh, and so uh, it's not that when you reach there, somehow things just become a hell of a lot easier. There's these great forces that you still have to beat back in order to continue to be the best version of yourself. Okay, I'll just uh, jump in with my next question. Um, Steve, in chapter number six, you talk about law school, the unconventional way. And um, I'm just gonna ask for you to uh, expand or provide your thoughts on uh, unconventional or non-traditional paths that you've experienced. Uh, I think I think we've experienced them together. Um, we, I, I was in Ottawa with you at the time. Uh, so if you can just talk about the unconventional way or non-traditional path and how that's played a role in in your life. Mm. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that. Uh, um, and I, I was fortunate to have. Uh, that same story covered in the Law Times uh, that was just published the other day, um, where the, the, the title of the article is encouraging other racialized lawyers uh, uh, to share their unconventional experiences, maybe getting into law. And th the reason for that is um, what that does is it allows people to feel comfortable, first of all, to share it. And then secondly, it provides hope to people who may not have a linear path to success, right? Uh, as I say in the book, some of us will have to climb the rough side of the mountain to get to the top, right? And uh, certainly my experience was no different. And so people would see me and say, okay, Steve's a lawyer for 17 years with the TTC. So obviously what he did is he wrote his outside exam, got into law school, got into the University of Ottawa, and now he's a lawyer at the TTC. Game over. Nice story, Steve. But no, it wasn't like that for me. Uh, hence, driven to succeed, right? And the obstacles that we talk about. Briefly, what happened, I was, as you know, I was in Detroit. Um, uh, didn't get into a Canadian law school. And that was the only school that accepted me at the time. And so I went because I, I wanted to pursue my dreams at all costs. Um, what I didn't realize was <laughs> the cost. <laughs> that was what it was going to cost us financially. I mean, you know, Canadian schools at the time were charging about, imagine, so this is dating ourselves, about five to $6,000 uh, for tuition for law school. And Detroit was charging 20,000 US. So I went there for one year. Hence the reason why I had to take the year off and work in the collection agency. And so before going back for the second year, I was doing some research as I was getting ready to go back to Detroit. It said, study abroad on a letter of permission for one year. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, this sounds entertaining. Why not? So I contacted Ian, who was at the University of Manitoba, and I said, hey, listen, do you want to join me on this letter of permission? We could go to a Canadian school together. So uh, Ian readily agreed. And uh, it was through Ian's suggestion, I believe, we were just talking about this the other day, where we decided that we were going to apply to the University of Ottawa and do that letter of permission there. And we did. We both got accepted for that one year. But here's the kicker. At the end of the one year, you had to go back. I had to go. It's This feels like Cinderella. You know, you go to the ball and the clock strikes 12 and you know you have to go back to being the stepsister and cleaning up the kitchen. That's the way I felt in going back to Detroit. Like I knew I had to go back. Ottawa was the ball. I was having a great time. I was paying less tuition. I was with my best friend and I was living the dream. And then the the light switch just went on. I was like, I can't go back to Detroit. And so I booked uh, an appointment with the associate dean. And I met with him and, he, and uh, you know, I said, look, I, I, I want to say, first and foremost, I love it here at University of Ottawa. It's a great program. And I just poured it out to him. And I said, listen, I really don't want to go back to Detroit. And he listened intently. 
Um, and then he rocked back in his chair, didn't say a word for it, but what seemed like an eternity. And he said, first of all, Steve, thank you for your positive feedback. But I want to share with you something. What you're requesting has never happened before in a history of in, in the University of Ottawa. You're going to have to go back to Detroit and fulfill the contractual obligation. So, of course, I'm defeated, but I'm still driven. And I'm thinking to myself, I need to get more involved in school. I need to get a bunch of professors on my side. I need to do something to make sure that I stay at the University of Ottawa. Long story short, it was one professor in particular, Joanne St. Louis, a constitution professor, you know that, uh, Ian. She became such a strong advocate. And at the end of my second semester, when it was just time for me to go back to Detroit, the ball was almost over. She went to the Dean's office along with other professors and they advocated to the Dean that Steve Anderson needs to stay here at the University of Ottawa. And that is folks, how I graduated from the University of Ottawa. It was because these professors said he needs to stay here. So history making wasn't just in Shelburne. It wasn't just at the TTC. It actually happened at the University of Ottawa that allowed me to graduate from the University of Ottawa and get that job at the TTC. And so to me, that just wasn't, hey, I got lucky. That wasn't because I had a great smile. That wasn't just because I put in the work, which I did. To me, and again, this is not Bible thumping. This is just my beliefs. There was no question I felt that God was steering away and creating this pathway for me to get where I needed to get. And that door opened for me that had never opened for anybody before, but it opened for me and allowed me to graduate at the University of Ottawa, graduate from the University of Ottawa, and then walk into that job at the TTC. So uh, to me, it felt like, you know, the, the, the proverbial rod of Moses being dropped in the Red Sea parting. And all I had to do was this cross in faith. And that's what I did. I'll just add, I thought that was, I think that was the first, uh, your first election campaign that you ran. Because when I, <laughs> when I witnessed what you were up to uh, and, and your success uh, in achieving and getting that done, I, I was on a letter of permission also. And I had to, I was in my third year, so I was graduating. And I had to go back to Manitoba and graduate from Manitoba. But when I witnessed what you were doing, I said, wow, this is, this is Steve with his determination. It, it was amazing and it worked out well for you. Um, as I said, your first election, your first successful election campaign right there. And I think everybody here uh, who is listening, and I, and I really sincerely thank you for being a part of this discussion, uh, has a story of perseverance. Um, I know most of you didn't get to where you are uh, magically or simply, and that uh, for many of us, we did have to overcome obstacles. And it's important, uh, you know, there's a saying, let our light shine. It's important that we share um, the triumphs and also the difficulties because it serves, again, as um, a crutch uh, for those uh, who are struggling and not thinking because of the circumstances they find themselves in that success is possible. And so when we're prepared and this is what was important during the book. And what I, another thing to Bella's point about what did I learn is when I have people approach me and say, hey, Steve, you know, when you shared that story of you being in ESL, that was me. Or thank you for being authentic because it, it's, you know, uh, it reminds me of X or Y. It made me realize that when we are vulnerable, our vulnerability is like a key that allows and unlocks other people to live free. Let that sink in. Because, because I was vulnerable, when I did an event, you know, anyways, I'm not gonna, anyway. because I was vulnerable, there were people who were approaching me and saying, and sharing things with me that they had never shared with even some of their family members or their friends, because they've amassed and built this persona of who they are today, and that's how they want to be known. They don't want to be known as the person that was in ESL or who was in Jane and Finch or whatever the case may be. But because I became vulnerable, it's almost as if my vulnerability unlocked and gave them permission for them now to be vulnerable. And I say, that's the only way we can help each other. If I just scratched the surface and said, look at me, I'm the deputy mayor for the town of Shelburne. I'm bawling with my boy, Ian, and I'm, I'm living a good life. That may have appealed to a couple of people, but it wouldn't appeal to the people that I've, I've currently appealed to and the impact that the book is having uh, currently is because of that vulnerability. And I know that you can't share your business with everybody, 
but you have to be able to share it with somebody that you could trust uh, because that will help them and it will certainly help you in return. And so that was important to me in doing that. As difficult as it was, I thought it was still important to do so. Okay, and thank you for that response, Steve. I have one final question, then I'll allow uh, Alethea to wrap it up or uh, take, take more questions from the chat. Um, my final question is going to be to, uh, towards, I'm gonna ask you to speak towards the competitive nature. You touched on competitive nature earlier and uh, I know it, I know it well. We've, uh, we've, we've uh, played basketball together, we've studied together, we've taken courses together and I've uh, always said, you know, uh, well, we got to the point where it became, look, I'm no different than Steve, Steve's no different than me. If he can do it, I can do it. So uh, that competitive nature, I'd like you to speak to how that's brought out the best in you. Uh, and I, I welcome your thoughts. Um, my response is we all need to find things to motivate us um, because the, the winds of challenges and difficulties and setbacks and the murmurs of those who are going to tell you that you can't um, uh, are going to be prevalent in your life. And sometimes, unfortunately, that may even come in your inner circle. Uh, and if you don't have a purpose, it can't be somebody else's purpose. It has to be your purpose. Um, and so you have to find something that motivates you. And so for me, uh, the motivation, you know, oftentimes we look outside of our households uh, for heroes, uh, you know, our LeBron James and our Barack Obamas and whoever else. Um, but there are many unsung heroes, uh, even in our own household. And my mother, as you know, Ian, at your mother as well. Uh, you know, I say oftentimes uh, they will never make it on the front page of the news. Uh, they won't be in the history books. Uh, uh, they're very unlikely to be celebrated as heroes in our community, but they're heroes nonetheless. And, and, it's just a, and they're just as deserving of the attention. Seeing what my mother did in the household and the sacrifices that she made after the separation of my father, where we had, she had eight mouths to feed and never complained and went to her factory job, paper factory job and never missed a day. Um, I thought to myself, I owe it not only to myself, but I owe it to her to make sure, and not to say that there weren't setbacks and all this other stuff and trouble that I got myself into, but there was this overwhelming feeling that I owe it to her not to be a disappointment. When I got into university and then I eventually had children, I would, when it came to tough times, especially during my exams, law school exams, every time, you know, there's always people chattering around you, talking about, you know, you know what they studied last night and there's a lot of distraction. I would always take out my wallet and then open it up and look at my two children. And it allowed me as a reminder why I have to do what I gotta do. Because the alternative was not something that I was prepared to consider. Uh, and so that's what uh, the, the motivation, if you wanna call it the competition, the edge, the chip on the shoulder, uh, it all came from that uh, and it continues today. Uh, and that's why, you know, when you read the book, for those who have read it, uh, I made it a point to celebrate uh, my mother, not only during the course of the book, but certainly uh, dedicating a chapter to her. And for those who follow me on social media, you will know uh, I was blessed that the Jane and Finch Mall agreed to feature me inside the mall. Uh, talking about going to the mall, Jane and Finch Mall, where I used to go meet my mom uh, at the CIBC with the metal trolley uh, for her to come off of work and just go straight to the teller. And then we would go to Byway and all these other things. And I would hide the bag in another bag so that my friends wouldn't laugh at me as we're walking back to Eddie Stone. And so I took her back just last weekend, right to the door that we lived at, at 156 Eddie Stone. And then we then made our way to the Jamie Finch Mall and I got her flowers and she had the book in her hand and the big billboard was behind us with my picture <clears throat> and the quote. To me, that was a culmination to show her that the sacrifice was all worth it. And so for those who have championed you along the way, that should be your motivation to overcome <clears throat> the difficulties that you are facing 
uh, may have faced, continue to face, find your purpose, find your reason and allow that. And when you get to the top of the mountain, make sure you're giving, as Curtis would say, making sure you're giving your flowers. Check out the drip, by the way. Give your flowers to those who have helped you to get to where you need to get because it does take a village. Success is not obtained by oneself. And so let's not forget the people that have lifted us up. And for me, that's why I make it a point to honor her in the way that she deserves because of the sacrifices that she made. Um, and so it's just a blessing to be able to do that. So that's where it, it came from for me. And of course, there was you and I competing against one another. That was secondary. The true motivation with those factors. Thanks for the response, Steve. I'm going to pass it over to Alethea. Awesome. I can't think of a better note to end the session um, with than how you just ended it, you know, paying homage to those who lifted you up along the way, especially your mom. Um, before we close for the night, I just wanted to um, welcome two um, additional guests, Alex and um, Ryan. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and supporting um, Steve Anderson and his book, Driven to Succeed, and, of course, supporting Dufferin County Canadian Black Association. As I mentioned at the beginning of the call, proceeds from uh, the book will go towards um, some amazing charities, one of which is the Dufferin County Canadian Black Association. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to tune in for our regular scheduled session, which is going to be November 2nd for our next Ask for Expert series. That session will be on home ownership made easy. So. I invite you to check out our website and uh, stay connected to our social media platforms to uh, register for the next event. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night.